as, um, as Susanna described, we're going to talk a little bit about um, a modality that uh, some people in the world know quite well and many do not. And uh, we spent, oh, perhaps the past eight years focused on understanding the opportunity to make differences in, uh, in postpartum hemorrhage. And, uh, and not just with, uh, there's no single vertical dropped in device or, or approach that will treat all women. But for this particular um, talk, I'd like to spend, um, spend our time, I think, focused on this, this specific modality. Um, Susanna, how do I make a slide go forward? So you can you will see an arrow that goes next at the very bottom of your slide. I can do that for you. Oh, I see. Okay, right. Okay. So this is a woman in South Sudan, and just as a reminder to all of us that uh, that postpartum hemorrhage is the number one killer of pregnant women on Earth, and and uh, about 2.8 million women either lose their lives or become disabled from pregnancy-related causes on Earth, and the number one cause is postpartum hemorrhage. This woman is from South Sudan, and that's a country that has arguably the worst uh, maternal health indices on the planet. I guess they're rivaled by some areas of um, the border of Somalia and Kenya, uh, Afghanistan, and Sierra Leone. But in South Sudan, as high as one in six women will lose their lives from pregnancy-related causes in her lifetime. And there is no other gap on our planet that is as wide as the gap of that of safety and survival in pregnancy than that of um, between the haves and uh, those that are lucky enough to live in well-resourced settings and those that are not. So our work looking at uh, how to be helpful in the domain of uh, postpartum hemorrhage began eight years ago. And eight years ago, we were asked by the World Bank, as well as the Ministry of Health in South Sudan, if we could go ahead and develop a package to support the emergency conditions that most likely were confronting mothers children and newborns at the community level in South Sudan. And South Sudan certainly is, uh, is an extraordinarily challenging environment, has supply lines that are essentially non-existent, and uh, in some areas of the country truly um, couldn't be more austere or rudimentary. And so we thought hard. You know, We spent uh, quite a bit of time working with stakeholders as well as with providers in the country to define what were the, we ended up with nine different areas of focus. And then one of those, of course, ended up being, OK, postpartum hemorrhage at the community level in South Sudan is a primary killer. It's a major killer. How could we authentically become, uh, how could we authentically try to be helpful? And and at that time, eight years ago, there were no uterotonics in South Sudan at all. And uh, we weren't in a position at that time for a variety of political reasons to be able to bring uterotonics to bear. Therefore, I went out and I personally bought 20 Bakri balloons and realized that I would personally go bankrupt uh, if I continued along this, um, this particular path. And so we realized it was time to really look around the planet and who's done what, where, and how, and then design something new that we could try. So we developed the uterine balloon that uh, really a take off from some other varieties, but self-contained, not using IV tubing, and not needing uh, things that actually didn't exist at the community level in South Sudan. This is essentially what it is. It's a 60 cc syringe. It's a 26 or 24 Foley catheter with a lure lock in the end. So you actually can use the Foley catheter itself as an introducer, as well as essentially the uh, 
the sort of the pipe down to a condom that is uh, ultimately just tied to the end. Now we developed a package that was not just this device, but also a training package, which included uh, really a horizontal approach and uh, um, all of active management of the third stage of labor, plus um, you know, plus uterine balloon, but also plus all other uh, advanced modalities, so that this was really a horizontal look at postpartum hemorrhage. Um, we went ahead and uh, deployed this in South Sudan, and and soon thereafter started hearing stories, stories coming from different parts of the country. But stories aren't science, and stories are not going to save women's lives at large. So we did in one area of the country that was safe, as safety was becoming more and more of an issue. We had trained 874 frontline health workers, basically traditional, uh, you know, traditional birth attendants, illiterate frontline health workers, and um, and we conducted a small case study, basically using what's called snowballing approach in eastern Equatoria, and came up with four, you know, came across 14 women who were profoundly ill, hemorrhaging uncontrollably, and yet the providers had uh, learned about use of uterine balloon tamponade and had successfully been able to arrest hemorrhage and save these women's lives. So with that information, we weren't going to change the world, but we did go ahead then and ask the country of Kenya, the Ministry of Health, would you like to build on this and would you like to work with us to, uh, to see what we might be able to do to afford um, you know, the opportunity to save lives elsewhere in the world. So true to form, the Ministry of Health in Kenya said, well, gosh, we're just, here are 12 facilities, and they were all facilities run entirely by an unbelievably focused, each facility an unbelievably focused and, you know, uh, entrepreneurial midwife. And this included in western Kenya, in some poor areas, as well as the slums of Nairobi. Over that first year, some seven years ago or so, we ultimately had 24 cases of women that were that were that began hemorrhaging and failed uterotonics and continued to hemorrhage, and uh, all 24 of them survived. Uh, you know, with a balloon being placed and arresting their hemorrhage. That became really a tipping point. We were able to gain um, uh, some grant resources and then. Uh, we're able to expand the work from then on. So rolling forward to today, we have now deployed this package. So it's wall chart, checklist, uh, a three-hour training program, principally for midwives, um, but certainly also for um, other, whoever is delivering babies in whatever uh, region that uh, we've been asked to come work. So this is now deployed in nine countries. It's a na national policy in Ghana and in Kenya and in India. And uh, there are a number of other countries knocking on the wall, uh, knocking on the door. In fact, 22 countries. The Inter-American Development Bank has asked that uh, this package be brought into eight countries in Central and South America. So there's lots and lots of work to be done, incidentally. Anybody that's listening or anybody that knows anybody that's interested, we have no shortage of opportunity to work together in countries around the world as this is beginning to expand. We have now quite a bit of research that we've conducted, and in fact, so much so that it's really no longer um, necessary to try to prove that a uterine balloon can play a key role and can arrest hemorrhage, but now the, the research that, that really needs to be undertaken is how can we create implementation strategies so that women all around the world do have access to the ability to end their uh, maternal hemorrhage before the maternal hemorrhage actually ends their lives. So the summary of uh, our findings to date, uh, in brief, that uh, we have really strong data that shows the following, that a uterine balloon can immediately arrest hemorrhage. All cadres of folks um, at the lowest level of, of uh, birth attendance 
can place the uterine balloon. Overall, we have a 97% survival from uncontrolled postpartum hemorrhage when all else has failed. And that's not trivial because the entry criteria as per WHO and for all of our research is that a woman that has failed uterotonics, failed other non-operative modalities, and oftentimes they've failed a couple of doses of uterotonics, so they're fairly downstream. And to have such a high survival rate is encouraging. We have very good evidence from two countries in a, a study that we did that it averts emergency hysterectomy. Now, when a mother presents, so one of the comments that's come up fairly frequently is, is why don't you just publish a recipe? You know, it's a Foley catheter. It's a, it's a, you know, it, it's a syringe, and uh, and people can do this. So interestingly enough, so we actually looked at that quite. Um, you know, quite carefully, and probably no surprise to any of us um, that without having something packaged, without having something organized, and with a clinical pathway that's uh, supportive, survival rate drops precipitously. And it makes sense. And what we learned mostly is that people actually, if they have a recipe, they actually don't put this together. And then suddenly, when a woman's in trouble, people go, oh my goodness and scamper around and try to jury-rig something together. It doesn't work nearly as well, and there's significant delay. We also have uh, followed women, and uh, there are no complications. Actually, we've had one case of endometritis uh, that did just fine. So I'll go over just a little bit more detail here. But we have a shock paper that will be coming out in the uh, uh, IJGO, International Journal of Obstetrics and Gynecology. And here are um, the here's the bottom line, and that uh, we have uh, a four country uh, cohort of women, just over 300 women that have had uterine balloons placed when all else has failed. They're actively hemorrhaging, and uh, they have failed multiple doses of uterotonics. In our cohort, we have just over 40 percent of them that were actually in shock and uh, means that their blood pressure had uh, begun to drop and that they also have an altered mental status. Interestingly enough, so long as their blood pressure isn't yet below 90 and they haven't uh, had, um, they, they don't have an altered mental status, um, they essentially have a 99 to 100% survival when a uterine balloon is placed. Makes sense if you can arrest hemorrhage before people start spiraling into um, you know, a state where DIC is looming and uh, where they've begun to cascade into uh, path, you know, abnormal pathophysiological responses, uh, chances are good women will survive. Class 3 shock, which is a blood pressure between 90 and 70 systolic and an altered mental status but not unconscious yet, class 3 shock, we are have, we, we are still lucky enough in a large cohort of 97% survival, so a balloon is placed, hemorrhage is able to be arrested, and they're able to be resuscitated. Most often in the regions where we have done this work, that type of fluid resuscitation is actually oral because they're very they're in remarkably lower level settings. Now, survival drops precipitously when a mother is unconscious and her blood pressure is less than 70 systolic the uh, survival rate is 86 percent. One would certainly expect a much higher percentage. These are, again, women that have uncontrolled hemorrhage. But uh, 86 percent now is uh, unfortunate. We're losing significant number of mothers. Actually, every mother is significant. Nonetheless, it is an improvement over an expected mortality. So I think the really what we hear here is, is, is um, if someone is having uncontrolled hemorrhage, don't wait until they're unconscious don't, and, uh, and have a blood pressure less than 70 before you actually try to intervene and arrest their hemorrhage with a uterine balloon. Another, uh, I mean, I touched on this, but uh, we actually formally looked and uh, published a couple of papers that, um, that while improvised use or improvising a uterine balloon is able to save lives, that its success rate is much lower 
than if a kit is at the ready and a kit is designed to, um, in fact, be able to rapidly expand the, the uterine balloon, which is the condom, at the end. We use 60 cc syringes, and we discovered that when people improvise, most areas or, 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 or midwives or traditional birth attendants or lower level facilities don't have 60 cc syringes. They might have a 10 or they might have a 5. And if we, we, we just noticed recently, we looked carefully in India, and, and uh, the mean amount of uh, water placed into one of these is 550 cc. So, so if someone has a 5 or 10 cc syringe, you can imagine the amount of times you need to actually try to um, you know, pump, draw water and pump in order to be able to fill a balloon. Um, now, postpartum hemorrhage, while it takes most of the lives that, uh, that it takes, you know, are on the African continent, oh, I think all of us know that, uh, that it can happen most anywhere in the world at really any level of care. And, and um, you know, the rates are quite interesting and different, but Certainly, in low resource settings, somewhere around four to five percent of women will have postpartum hemorrhage per the definition, uh, which is actually a rather outdated definition. And then somewhere around ten percent of those will fail standard interventions and uh, and would be then candidates for a uterine balloon. Now, emergency hysterectomy, we, we looked in the countries of Senegal as well as Kenya and uh, essentially went through a formal type of uh, mixed methods research process um, it, it, across three do 30 doctors that had placed um, between them uh, just over 80 uterine balloons. And we analyzed their care before and after introduction of uterine balloon. And these doctors all had the capabilities of performing hysterectomies, were in facilities where they could perform hysterectomies. And I essentially saw that um, the uterine balloon really abolished the practice of hysterectomy. I must say, we were just in Tanzania last week, and we have uh, implemented the uterine balloon in Dar es Salaam, in the capital, amongst uh, the National Teaching Hospital, as well as the surrounding three district hospitals. And the chairman of OBGYN lamented that suddenly he doesn't know how he's going to train his residents um, how to perform emergency hysterectomies for hemorrhage because in the last year since the uterine balloon was implemented, they suddenly don't have emergency hysterectomies to perform when previously it was a common operation. I found that very interesting and uh, an interesting quandary, so to speak, if one would want to call it that. Safety, we uh, tracked 183 women consecutively who had uterine balloons placed. There was one case of endometritis. Otherwise, there were no uterine balloon associated complications. And this has really suddenly become a very important study that uh, was just conducted. I had no expectations this would be the case, but we've just learned that the Food and Drug Administration here in the United States, uh, there's a path to obtaining approval. Uh, so this that really will help open the doors for rural regions in the United States, Canada, uh, and, and other areas of the world that, uh, that um, might use the Food and Drug Administration as a guideline as to whether something can be adopted. So at the end of the day, happy looking uh, mom with a beautiful little baby. This is, of course, what we all seek. And I think, I think I'll like to pause here so that we can have some conversation. But um, I think it's important to walk away from this and recognize that anybody can put in a uterine balloon. And the balloon, the balloon device that we use, there are many of them out there. Um, there's no need to spend 400 US dollars for a uterine balloon. But what is important is that once the decision is made to place a balloon, that uh, that that 
don't feel constrained to have to only put in a certain amount, rapidly fill it until the bleeding stops. Uh, certainly condoms are high volume, low pressure systems. They've been tested at uh, MIT as well as PATH in Seattle, and they won't rupture a uterus. Uh, and, um, and it's interesting to see that we have, uh, we have as much as 1,200 cc's having been placed in a balloon filling a uterus after uh, a twin uh, delivery. So it can really vary anywhere from generally 250 to 300 cc's all the way up to 1,200 cc's. And as I just described, out of uh, a cohort of 57 cases since just in the last, uh, since the end of January, uh, amongst the proof of concept implementation in India, the mean amount of fluid placed in a balloon was 550 cc. Survival rates are very high, and especially high if a balloon is placed early. It can avert emergency hysterectomy. Obviously, if you wait longer, uh, a, a woman has a, a tougher time of surviving. And in fact, I, I say this not with not meant to be any humor, but the reality is we have several cases around the world where where a woman is essentially moribund, dead, and uh, somebody places a uterine balloon, hoping that the uterine balloon will 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 bring her back, and uh, and the uterine balloon cannot raise people from the dead. That that we do know. We know it's safe, and uh, and as I stated, we know that uh, all cadres can place the uterine balloon. So with that, um, I'd like to go ahead and pause. And uh, Susanna, do you want to um, moderate some conversation, if we can? Yes. So thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, if anybody has a question, please go ahead. I know the, we also have some polls, and we will invite the audience to participate in that. So. Here is, go to those questions. There you go. There. So from the participants, have you ever had a case of um, unresponsive postpartum hemorrhage? We see the number is increasing for the death. Mm -hmm. So We also have a question for from Eva. I'm just going to finish the poll here, but it seems like more than a half of the people who answered actually have had a case of unresponsive postpartum hemorrhage. So I'm going to answer this. OK, so Eva's question is, how long does the balloon stay in the uterus? Eva, that's a great question. And nobody knows the answer exactly. And I think um, you know we generally say uh, you know don't take it out in the middle of the night. Uh, you know, light of day is a, is a better time to certainly take the uterine balloon out. But generally speaking, you know, 10, 12 hours. But you know, I think the way I would describe it also or think about it is that. Not all postpartum hemorrhage, in fact, I would say all postpartum hemorrhage, each case is different. Just as if, you, if, if someone said to you, how long should I keep a bandage on this area on my arm that I, you know, that I cut open? The question should be, well, how big is that cut? The same thing will be true with the endometrium. Do we just have a small area that's, that, that's the cause of the hemorrhage? 
or has been there, is there a large area of, of tissue that's at risk and vulnerable? And so generally, you know, if someone has a massive hemorrhage and they're sick, the balloon is going to be kept in longer. It's common sense. And so it's really about judgment. So suppose at the 10 hour mark, you think, wow, she's been really stable for a while. And uh, you may take a 50 to 100 cc's and see where you are. Just just pause for half an hour. See if she does fine. See if she's, there's any recurrence of bleeding. If not, then take out another 50 cc's. And maybe every 30 minutes, take out 50 cc's. Hey, thank you for your answer. Um, we have another question for, from Fatima. Uh, she's asking if this study is only useful for poor countries. Yeah. So the research that we've been undertaking has been in many different countries. Uh, and it's been in all the way from national teaching hospitals. And for instance, in India, the Ministry of Health insisted that it starts off with very high level tertiary care medical schools that are, I must say are as equipped as anywhere in the world. And it's gone all the way down to the most rural level and most difficult setting that you can imagine. So, so it's basically every setting where this has been utilized. However, I must say originally this was thought to be for South Sudan and then similar poor countries. Uh, but since then, uh, I've certainly learned um, that there are plenty of midwives, family doctors, and others, uh, in the, even in the United States, that um, have, have asked, my goodness, we cannot afford a 400 US dollar balloon for our community level where I particularly practice. Can you, can you help us? And the answer is, of course, yes. Thank you. We have another question from Terry. Terry says that she's trying to figure, uh, to picture how the condom is used at the end of the polycatheter. Yeah. So there's, um, there actually is a how-to video that we had made by, uh, medical aid films in London that I think we can um, refer people to at the end here. Um, but essentially, you can imagine taking a string and tying a condom to the end of a Foley catheter where the string is, the string is actually, um, and, and where it's tied, the actual Foley balloon itself is beyond that, beyond being it's inside of the um, actual area of where the uh, of where the condom is. So then you can put this up with two fingers, you know, insert it up through the cervix into the uterus, and then the first thing you do would be to take the Foley balloon port and fill that. Go ahead and fill that with 20 cc's, 30 cc's of water. Now that will actually help hold the Foley catheter, uh, I mean, help hold the uh, condom onto the end of the Foley catheter. And then you can move to the other port, which has a lure lock in it, and now fill that with water until the condom is tightly in place, uh, and that actually functions as the uterine balloon. I hope that helps, but I would ask, you know, refer you to uh, to the video that we'll send you, um, you know, the website so you can look at that video. Thank you. I actually have um, shared the uh, web page link in the chat box, Great. so you can visit the web page and you will see the more. You will have more information there as well. There are a number of videos there that have been made by midwives um, that uh, you might find uh, enjoyable and interesting to see. Okay, so Terry says that, thank you, that was quite clear. So I think, OK, 
Okay, there is that. Teresa, I just wanted to say that I think this is a fantastic and could see a place for this, for a midwife supporting women to birth outside the hospital setting. I cannot agree more. Yeah. Make, make, make it safer for women everywhere they're delivering. Yeah, so Terry is asking another question. Oh, apparently we have Sarah is sharing on YouTube. Yes. Terry, yes. Hmm. Yes, Terry, you made a very good point for those communities that they have uh, regulated home births. That would be a great option. Eva Maybe is also the, the right. The link that share, Sarah shared. Yeah. Um, so we're going to wait until Eva is typing her question. I guess we can go to the polls again. I, mm -hmm. Yep. I mean, I really like what Terry wrote. Um, and this is something we've been thinking about for a while. Not just, not just uh, you know, when, when, when there are actual kits that are organized and in place, we all function better in what we do in an emergency circumstance. It, you know, the more sort of program that is. And uh, this is something that I'm actually going to the Gates Foundation next week to actually to work and think this through. And if, if there are people on the on here that are particularly interesting interested in the in thinking about uh, various aspects of of what it would mean to put together an emergency kit for midwives, I I would love for you to let Susanna know, and we can put our heads together in a different forum. Because I think this is, uh, I think you're right on. This is something that we should think about, certainly beyond facilities. And and there's no woman that's not at risk. So so this really is, uh, this is something that we should think about for the whole world, not just for poor women or for, or for a certain subgroup. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um. Yeah. Okay, so we have another question from Eva. Do you have any idea how it works compared yeah, so with I would, normally um, used? I would not think it would, it's not competitive with, it's not one or the other, of course. Um, so it, it, it really interesting that, um, you know, uterotonics, we were beginning to learn more and more about uterotonics and that, you know, different uterotonics do function a little bit differently. You can very quickly gain down regulation. In other words, you can use a uterotonic a couple of times and then realize it doesn't work anymore. And, but a different uterotonic may work. And uh, the uterine balloon probably has a mechanism of action. It's not just about pushing against the, uh, the endometrial uh, you know, area that's, um, that's really hemorrhaging and, 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 and aborts and averts that. I mean, it really you know, stops the hemorrhaging. But it probably also is um, able to stimulate the endocervix and the lower, lower uterine segment in a unique way that also contributes to contraction. And so none of us know this, and this is uh, more hypothesis than anything. Indian OBGYNs are absolutely convinced, and this is perhaps they put a lot more fluid than other countries, but that actually that a uterine balloon um, uh, fills the uterus and then it tilts back, which kinks off the uterine artery. 
which that's what they think is their mechanism is the mechanism of action. Maybe that's true. I don't think any of us know. However, um, I think uh, I think we I mean use uterotonics as you normally would, and the uterus when it if it does and when it does actually contract, we see this often that uh, that the uterus will you know it needs to rest and then when it, it sort of regains its uh, its oomph that it contracts and pushes the uh, you know sometimes it'll just push the it's it, the hour of six six hours or so push the uterine uterine balloon right out of the uh, uterus and you know into the vagina and it'll spill out so so I think um, think of them as complementary. Yes. So, do we have any other questions from from the audience? As we are waiting for more questions, let's go to the next poll because we are curious to know. On you can see there if you have ever. If you have ever had a patient who had to go for an emergency hysterectomy due to uncontrolled postpartum hemorrhage, wow, and it keeps and it increases them. Eh? It almost seventy percent of the audience has had an emergency emergency hysterectomy due to EPH. Good. And it keeps going up. Yeah, and if we imagine in those yeah. settings where they don't even have an OR facility, so that sounds even more terrible. So let's go to our next pool while we're, w oh, there's um, another question from Alicia. So are there cases where this is not I effective? I would say that, um, that we have women that have uterine balloons placed when they have lost a great deal of blood already and they're in shock. And and then are in DIC and have a coagulopathy such that um, that you know they still are in this horrible downward spiral and don't survive. The balloon was placed too late, or they had had a fetal demise that had been quite some time you know ago, and uh, and these women are terribly sick. So that's really you know you know that's. It, yeah, it, they're, they need more. They need blood products, and they need uh, they need other interventions if there's going to be a chance to survive. The uterine balloon, um, you know, isn't uh, isn't sometimes able to answer their need. And certainly, the uterine balloon is, you know, generally it's it's uh, well, and certainly by WHO standards and others, it's reserved for atonic uterus only. However. There are some amazingly creative midwives that we've uh, that have taught us all sorts of things that they've done, such as um, you know using it intentionally for multiple lacerations within the vagina, and just uh, one midwife actually just ultimately could not stop hemorrhaging from many different locations vaginally, and placed a uterine vagina. Blew it up and kept it there for two days, and then the woman did well. Um, uh, we have other. We have certainly have post-abortion uh, hemorrhage that is significant and life-threatening, where we have a number of cases of uterine balloon use and uh, other uses as well. But generally speaking, and certainly for the political arena, oh, we just we describe it for uh, atonic postpartum.
Mm -hmm. Thank you again. So I think Alicia is asking and is typing another question. Uh, just to remind you. Oh, thank you. It sounds. Yeah, no, I as if never there seen are not that. all places have, where the blood um, is still in our, We have 117 the facilities that are laboratories, so to speak, and we have uh, 547 uh, urine balloons placed, and we have not seen that. So that's Okay. And Terry also is asking uh, or making a comment, would be interesting to see data on women who have right. had I mean, this used to go you onto know, normal say, hey, delivery if I've postpartum. had a uterine balloon, this am I going to have a normal collect, pregnancy next time? Mm -hmm. Or has something changed or happened? Um, we don't have that data. Um, we don't have reason to believe the uterine balloon is, you know, it's, it's certainly atraumatic, but you're right, we don't know. Mm -hmm. So that's a very good question for uh, future research. Um, so Tima is typing a question, I believe. Uh, so just to remind everyone well, that we're going to be wrapping up in the next three minutes. So we we'll give some time for the next presenter. Um, so ask all your questions. Uh, Tima is, but uh, I cannot understand it well your question, Fatima. You're asking about if this may be increased. I'm sorry, can you write again your question, Fatima? And Cecilia, and I Oh, thank you, Cecilia. It says that I think we sh yeah. would spell it earlier. I mean, that, that is absolutely interesting. With blood um, and one contract. And something. So we all know that yeah, when there, when the uterus has clots in the, you know, in the in the cervix or in in the uterus itself, that it, it prevents the uterus from doing it from doing its thing. You know, which is. Uh, contracting. However, we also know that you know the uterus becomes exhausted and uh, dysfunctional or afunctional, and uh, you know what the what the uterine balloon probably does is it stops the hemorrhage, letting the uterus recover its um, its normal state. And when it recovers, you know then it's time to uh, you know begin to withdraw the uterine balloon and allow it to. Um, you know, allow it to contract on its own. So, and you know, something that actually has come up in discussion a lot is, my goodness, if the, if the uterus is filled with this with this balloon, it's not going to act in a similar vein to a you know a clot, and it's going to prohibit the uh, the uterus from contracting. Well, we haven't seen that. We have plenty of cases of where the uterus uh, contracts and pushes the balloon out. But um, you know, this is anecdote. I don't have. I think it's a, a very fair question and something that we need to understand better. Uh, the good news is that you know, when the when the balloon keeps the uterus distended and the bleeding is stopped, when the balloon is finally taken out, the uterus nicely contracts. So I think we have to learn more about how this all actually interacts. But for now. It's um, it it is arresting hemorrhage and it is mm -hmm. saving lives, but uh, indeed it it does interact in some various ways with contraction of the uterus. Mm -hmm. And the last comment for, from Fatima that. This is so important because you cannot um, contract the uterus, I guess. That's what you mean. So we're just getting at the very end of our session. I don't know if you have any other slides there. Uh, yes. Oh, yes. Yes. So, 
that you have a last just have happy life and uh, and have children that go on yeah. to uh, <laughs> you know be healthy and uh, and uh, but it really all of it depends on the very beginning and, and what happens at this moment in time. Yeah. Okay, so thank everyone you. is saying thank lovely. Very much. Thank you Take good care. for the session. Bye Great now. session. Thank you for this. So, yeah. 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 So, we just, and yes. um, yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Thomas, for being with us at this session. Um, just to, yeah. So, just to finish this presentation, oh, Together, we can make the world a better place. What a nice way to finish the presentation. So um, for now, we're going to turn off our recording.